Father, we come before you and we thank you. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you told the way and you made the way and you said it was finished. And in that, you made a way for us to live a life beyond our natural limitations. You called us into a life of supernatural possibilities. And even as we sang, we believe that the God who can take dead people and make them come alive again is able to do wonderful things if we would surrender ourselves to you. For it is not in control, but in surrender that we are resurrected. So we surrender this word. It is your word. The God who speaks, speak to the hearts of your people. And may your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the microphone picks up on blowing the nose as well. <laughs> the joys. Okay, how's everyone this morning? Good? Okay, it's super warm in here. Don't fall asleep on me. We're at the final, um, the final section in um, Paul's letter to the th church in uh, Thessalonica. And it's been an amazing amazing journey. So Paul has written to this young church that he established over the course of four weeks, um, three Sabbaths. He speaks to them, teaches them, edifies them, and he writes this letter to encourage them. So initially, he's a little bit concerned about them. Then he hears some really good news about them. And so he's encouraged and he says, you guys are doing great, but I want you to do even better. And I want to encourage you with this. Um, and so we read um, at the start, um, Paul talked a little bit about some of the, the misunderstandings that were within the community. The second chapter, Paul defended himself and the rumors that were going around about him. And then he talked about this supernatural community. And we're going to finish up this epistle talking about church family. So... Um, before our vision came off the wall, um, what you saw on there was the first part of it is to be a gospel-centered community. And this is something God has really put in our hearts. Now, a gospel-centered community is not just a community that knows God's word and speaks God's word. It's a supernatural community. It is something that is not possible unless the Holy Spirit comes and moves and shakes and invades and changes and makes possible what is not naturally possible, okay? So here, Paul is going to tell us as he closes, and everyone knows when you're wrapping up a letter, the last bit, it really matters, right? It really matters because you kind of pull everything together and you say, here, this is the last bit. Take it, hold on to it. So this is the last bit we're going to read. Um, he's going to, um, if we can go to the first slide, please. He is going to uh, raise three points, three main points. This is an AI-generated image. How cool is that? Um, the other one had lots of hands, like people had multiple hands. It was very interesting. But um, he's going to raise three points. How the church should engage with leadership, how the church should fellowship, and how the church should worship. Okay, so we're going to read and we're going to talk about it. So let's go to the next slide where we will read. I thought I had the text in red, but I didn't, did I? Um, will you read with me? Okay. Now we ask you, brethren, uh, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard, in love, because of their work, live in peace with each other. So this section is where Paul talks about the leaders. Okay, so let's take a step back. We talked about this being a supernatural community, right? I want you to imagine that 
you are taken up and airlifted and then dropped down in the middle of a desert and all you have to get out of that place is a map. Okay, so you have a map with instructions on what, which way you should go, how you, what you should avoid, where you can find rations. You have a map. What would you do with the map? Yeah, got it with your life. Tuck it away in a safe place and never find it again. God tells us that his very word is spoken. So when we read scripture, it is God speaking. How would we respond if God actually, we heard an audible voice and God spoke. And yet, when we read scripture, it's nothing less than that. It's God speaking. So how do we respond? Scripture is not just a map. In the physical, God's word will tell us how to live and how to live a good life. Even the no's make the yeses better, right? So when he says, no, don't engage in intimacy outside marriage, it's because intimacy within marriage is, meant, is better when we understand why the no is put, right? So God is not withholding. When God says no, it's because the yes is beautiful in him, right? So we have a map, we have directions, we have instructions, but we have more than that. Scripture tells us this is not just a philosophy, this is not just a good way, this is not just the way, this is God. So one part of it is, yes, if you learn and you live and you practice, you will see what God intends for your life. But the second part of it is you will see God. Scripture tells us that as we see him, as he is, as we worship him, that's what transforms us to be more like him, right? So, he gives us leaders. Now, the word here, I ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work among you, who care for you in the Lord, who admonish you. It's a term, when he says he wo who work among you, it could be any sort of work, Right? But Paul uses this term, who labors among you frequently in his epistles. And generally, it's those who labor in the word. He's talking about those who labor in the word. So he's talking about those who admonish, those who work hard, those who labor in the word. So he's talking about pastors, but he's also talking about leaders. Right? It is easy for us in this day and age, because we come from, and I think COVID really accentuated this. We hated the fact that government could control. And so you have this rise at the moment of what they call sovereign citizens, people who believe that the government should not control them, people who believe that they're, they're a law to themselves, no law should be dictated over them. But we don't realize how much these attitudes come into the church, how much in the church we are like, oh, but we are. Why should we hear? Why should we listen? Why are they? Do we not all have the Holy Spirit? Are we not all equal? Yes, we are. But God appoints. So we, in Ephesians, he says, and he gave. He gave. He gives to the church for the edification, the building up. He gives. Not different in value, different in role. No different to husband and wife, different in role not different in value, okay? So he appoints, and it's important that we don't let these things, and it has been very hard, I think, because look, the church has not always done the right thing, right? The Royal Commission's investigation into the um, institutional abuse of children really made people question. Really made people question church authority. It made us want to go, how can we trust them? When we trust God's word, we trust the one who gives the word. We trust God, right? When we obey, we're saying, our oh, God is so big. He could use people like Pharaoh. He said, he's my appointed servant. He could use people like Nebuchadnezzar. He can use whoever it is that he appoints. So Christian, all authority, scripture says, is appointed by God. And so your pastors as uncomfortable as this topic is for me to teach you, um, are appointed by God. 
I'm not blowing my own trumpet, okay? And it is easy for us to critique. It is easy for us to critique because we live in a world where with the click of a button, you will have pop star pastors preaching amazing messages, right? And it's easy for us to go, oh, I wish my pastor was more funny or entertaining. I wish he brought, you know, those amazing analogies and those juggling bears and those background dances. It makes church so much more interesting. But we're called to preach the word, to edify, to uplift with the word, to build with the word, not to entertain you, right? You go to the circus for that, <laughs> right? That is not our role. That is not our role. And it's easy, but critique is like cancer. There's nothing that destroys a church community more than critique. See, the Thessalonian community had another problem. Because they had all their new believers, they've been leaders for a short while, they've appointed leaders from amongst them who had all come to the Lord at the same time. Now, how many of you know it's hard when your colleague gets promoted and you have to submit to their leadership? You know, in some of our teams, we start to see that. We'll, we'll, we'll see people that the Lord has appointed and we will go, okay, you were to lead these people. And then the others are like, well, why are they leading us? Aren't we all equal? Yes, you are. Equal in value, different in role. Understand how kingdom works. Understand how kingdom works. And the challenge for the church is, how do we engage with this? Scripture is very clear on how we engage with this. It says, hold them in the highest regard. Love them because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Do we always get it right? No. For those of you who don't know, we're bivocational, which means we also have work. We work, like you guys. And we minister, which means this church will not be as great as some of the other bigger churches that have funded Workers, most of your ministry leaders are bivocational. Most of your connect group leaders are bivocational. It's going to be easy to come away from something that is completely funded, and there is full-time ministers, to come away from it and go, oh, this works there. This is so much better there. This is how it works here. It's going to be easy. But scripture says, don't tear down, build up. Don't tear down, build up. Encourage them. Edify them. Treat them with honor. Look at the people among you, your leaders. Look at the people that labor. Look at the people that labor. And leaders should labor. That's why we don't have application for leaders. We look at the people among us, those who labor, without being needing to be told to labor. We look at people who are faithful and care for the people without being told. And those are the people. See, this is not like secular jobs where you go, this is the gifted person for this. He's a brilliant orator. Let's make him a pastor. See, when you look at the qualifications in Timothy of a pastor, of an elder, of a deacon, you don't see the gifting listed. You see the character listed. The character matters. It is the character that we look for. And so we don't have that process because we understand that God appoints and we must stand as ambassadors of God. And, and um, Pastor Shri talked about follow me as I follow Christ. So how does the church engage with leaders? So Paul talks about that. And then he says, and this is something I, I just put in. You know, the challenge is real. The challenge was real for Joseph's brothers when Joseph saw a dream. And they saw, you know, all of them worshiping him. And they're like, why should you be special? The challenge was real for the people in the town that Jesus came for because my kid played soccer with your kid. Why should my kid now listen to your kid? The challenge is real. But Jesus says, through John, in 1 John, he says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, he sees, cannot love the God he has not seen. The concept of authority is the same. We can say, I honor God. I obey God. The truth of the matter is how we obey who God places. And that is what we see. How can we obey a God we cannot see when we do not obey and honor those we see? Okay? 
So there will be no sovereign citizens in the church if we understood kingdom um, living. And then Paul goes on to talk about fellowship amongst brothers and sisters. So this is how the church family interacts with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, next slide, please. Thank you. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are disruptive. This is actually a military term, who are disruptive, those who fall out of line. There is an encouragement that we are to watch out for each other. Why does church community get hard? Because it's not just a place where we come and hang out. It is a place where we hold each other accountable. And sometimes that means going, mm, no, that's not actually how church works. Mm, that's actually not scripture. That's opinion. You know? And so he says, warn those who are idle. Now, let's talk about idleness. If we come into a church and we decide this is your church family, there is a period of time that you take to settle. After that period of time, there are no attendees in a church. A church is not a place you come and you observe and you walk away with no ties. A church is a place where you sow financially with your time and you serve, you connect, you grow together. So there is a period of time where it takes time and then there is a period of time. And so one of the roles is if we do come in and we're not connecting, we'll go, hey, let's connect. Let's nudge them in the shoulder and go, let's connect. Have you considered this? Have you, I've noticed this. There is a need in the church. Would you like to join in? Encourage the faint-hearted. Now, there's a reason Paul draws the line here. Because it's easy for us to look at people and go, oh, they're lazy. But sometimes they're faint-hearted. What does it mean to be faint-hearted? It is people whose hearts have lost courage. And sometimes there are people among us and their hearts are sad. They have lost courage. We're not called to admonish them. We're not called to diss them. We're not called to control them and say, why are you being lazy? We're called to put courage in them. So we must know the difference. We must know what's happening in their lives. We must know about people. We must know about those around us. And he says, you know, the word um, cur in Latin means heart. And these are people whose hearts are failing. Could there be people in the church community that have stepped in? And week after week, their hearts are struggling. And they could do with your encouragement, with your love, with your prayers, with your smiles. It's going to take you to step outside your comfort zone. But that's what church community is. That's what church family is. It's a supernatural community, which means naturally you should not be able to do it. You can say to me, this is not who I am. I get it. Naturally, I'm an introvert. I get it. God has a sense of humor. He picks the most unlikely people. I came from a family. There was an extrovert and there was an introvert. And he picked the introvert. Makes no sense. So I need supernatural providence to do what my natural cannot. Church is a supernatural community. You have supernatural providence to do what you cannot in the natural. Be patient, Paul says. We're all going to have problems. We're not going to get it right all the time. Don't nitpick. If you're looking to nitpick, there'll be plenty of reasons to nitpick with each other. There'll be people who don't smile. And you're going to be like, they don't like me. They might just be having a really bad week. You don't know unless you step into their world. Don't assume. There's, there's a saying that I should not quote from the pulpit about assumptions. They make certain things out of us. If you have heard the term, those who giggle have. Um, it's, um, 
you know, it's, it's not a form of knowledge assumptions. It's where we draw lines, and often those lines are clouded by how we see the world. You know, step in, be patient with people. And, and I really want to encourage you, you know, want this for us. Want this for this community. Want this. Because Jesus says, the church is not a way. When you read scripture, you see the church is God's way of equipping his saints. The church is God's way of building his people. The church is God's way of letting, creating a supernatural community that he says, when you are in me and I am in you and you love like I love, then the world will know. The church is the place where people step in and go, here's some people, here's a bunch of people that have nothing in common. They should not be getting along, not for this long. But here they are, and there is something weird happening here, and I want a piece of it. They don't give up on each other. They're not, they lift up the faint-hearted. They're not about themselves. It's a selfless community. The church needs to be something the world is not. It needs to stand out. And the last slide is your worship. So Paul's last edification to the church. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. How many of you have knelt down and said, God, tell me your will? What is your will for my life? We do it all the time. There is things that God will ask you to do, but there are things that I explicitly listen, lit, uh, sorry, written. Don't disregard what is explicitly written in search of other things. First, be faithful with what God has specifically told us. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. So what is Paul saying here? He's saying the Christian is not a person. Where your disposition, how you feel, changes based on your circumstance. So you have to keep changing your circumstance so you can feel happy. The Christian is the person that your disposition is consistent regardless of your circumstance. Because your joy is not about circumstance. So if you keep uprooting yourself and unplugging yourself from discomfort, you will never be a person that can have a joy that transcends circumstance. You can't be a person that rejoices always if you're just going for places and people that you can rejoice with. Am I making sense? Okay. There is a growing body of research that shows that gratitude is good for your health. It is better for your physical health. It's better for your mental health. Being grateful will literally save your life. People who are grateful are healthier. They're less depressed. They sleep better. They're less prone to addictions such as dependence on alcohol. They're better and they perform better in employment. Gratitude, an attitude of gratitude, literally changes the person you are. Now, how do we practice an attitude of gratitude? Because it is easier to critique, right? And so we saw it is easier to see what we lack. In the garden, Satan knew that. So when he comes to Eve, and Paul says this in the book of Romans, he says, because they didn't worship, their hearts were darkened. He comes to Eve, and he, all this is hers, but here's the thing you can't have. And so a feeling of entitlement starts to grow. Why is he withholding? The one thing I don't have is the one thing that will eat me up. I can't be grateful when I'm wondering why God is withholding. And when I'm not grateful, I have no joy. Entitlement steals your joy. And so we see the fragmentation of what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden over across generations. There was a survival expert in the military who was asked, what is the key to survival in any circumstance? And he said a positive mental attitude. But before he said it, Paul wrote it. Okay? And this is what I love about, you know, reading this stuff. 
when science cottons up to God, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So, so I want to encourage you, fight for this. You know, fight for this. This is worship. This is worship. He says, don't quench the spirit. Don't treat prophecies with contempt, but test them. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. You know, you, you live in a time where you're constantly getting messages about things you want. You, you getting them? Apparently, I win. I win lots of things. From uh, inheritance to lotteries that I don't buy. I'm constantly told that I have to pick up parcels of things I didn't purchase. Occasionally, I get calls from home affairs that I'm illegal. Um, there is a lot of scams out there. There's a lot of scams out there. So you get scam watches. You test. You go and check. Is this real? What's real? We check what's real. And that's what Paul is saying with prophecy. Don't dis disregard it. Prophecy is not simply the foretelling of the future. We see in the Old Testament when we read prophets, the role of prophets, they often came to warn. Prophets were often God's voice saying, hey, you're wandering away, come back. Come back. Don't disregard prophecy. Test all prophecy. Don't make it happen. Go, okay. Is this true? Is this good? And then he says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all of God's people with a holy kiss. Let's not do that today. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now, here Paul is edifying worship. He's edifying gratitude. He's edifying. And he has said this at the end where he's talked about obedience. Obedience to leadership. Obedience in how we live together with each other. Right? Because we know that all of this is worship. Right? When Abraham took Isaac to sacrifice him, he said, me and the boy will go worship the Lord. Worship is not a song. Worship is a life that is obedient to the Lord. I want you to imagine that I go over to Sri and Sri says to me, my love, can you please, I'm, I'm really hungry, can I have some dinner? And then I say to him, you're just too good to be true. I can't take my eyes off you. And he'd be like, that's great, but I'm still hungry. And then I go, I love you, baby, if it's quite all right. And then he goes, uh, really appreciating the music, but what about the food? It's a little bit what we do. Scripture tells us what God desires. Scripture tells us. What is his will for our life? And then we go, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. But we aren't. But we aren't. Worship is God's will for his holy people. It is why you and I are here. To be worshipers. It is our primary focus and it starts with obedience. Worship is everything you do. There is not some things that are holy and some things that are unholy. You worship when you're at work. Treat your boss like you're working for Jesus. Work like, let it be said of you that there is no one that works like this. No one that has an attitude like this. Work is not unholy. Everything you do is for Jesus. You are an ambassador. Everything we are called to do in all things. Right? So. As I close, this is my edification to you. It's Paul's edification to his people. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. How do we live like this? We can't in our natural strength. It's a supernatural thing. 
But it starts with our actions aligned with our mind. Where is your mind? Because if I am constantly thinking of all these other things, then that is where my actions will align. Be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And Bridgerton does not do that. <laughs> it's pleasurable, but it does not bring forth life like the Word of God does. So let's steward what God has given us. Let's believe that God has called us for something beautiful. God has called us to build something supernatural. He has called us to be a workmanship. Let's believe this for our church. Let's desire this for our church family. Let's eagerly wait on this. We're going to partake of communion. And as we do that, communion is a place of fellowship. It is a place of remembrance. It is a place of repentance. And as we partake of communion, I want to ask you, have we lived according to his word that we have heard? And like the Thessalonian church, you know, we boast because we've got a great bunch of people here. We've got people that love the Lord, love his people, and want to serve, want to love, want to do the hard thing. This is our church. But like the Thessalonian church, let's lift up our game, church. Let's lift up our game for him. You will take the emblems in your hand and close your eyes. You've heard the word of God spoken. And the word of God is for our good. It is for the building up. It is for the edification. If there's anything we want to say to him about anyone else, it should be on our knees. And this is our moment. This is our moment. If there's been unforgiveness, this is our moment. If there's been hurt, offense, this is our moment. Let us align our lives with the word of God and see God transform us and the spaces we are in. With his supernatural presence and providence. If we have been in rebellion in our actions or in our words against God's leadership, and that includes pastors or leaders, if we have mocked, belittled, criticized, it is not our burden to bear. We need to surrender it to him. If we have not loved his people, his church, his church family, his bride, the way he calls us to love, then this is the time we come back to the heart of the Father. If we have been entitled and not grateful for all that God has done, Manuel said as he opened this morning, he said, you will answer this question hopefully by the end of the service. Are we grateful for the little things? Are we grateful for the little things? You will find that circumstances will not dictate that joy you have in your heart. You can't miss a grateful person. Rejoice always. Pray continuously. Give thanks in all circumstance, for this is the will of God for you in Jesus Christ. As we come to this table, we remember that God called us. This is God's idea. Church family is not a fancy phrase we coined because it was cool. 
Church family is God's idea. It's God's people. Serving, loving each other in a way that does not make sense and glorifies God. We come together united by one blood, one Holy Spirit. We are one church. And we remember that the hope that we have is that one day, all of us, and this is why it's so important that we build and we don't let any fall away. We don't let the faint-hearted just sit there. We build, we build, because one day, all of us, we want to be sitting there at the marriage supper of the Lamb. All of us want to be doing this together as one family when he comes again for us. just want to give you a moment to search your heart and come back before we partake of the Lord's table. Conviction is not condemnation. We sang, you tore the veil, you made a way when you said it was done. When we repent, he restores completely, completely. And he remembers our sin no more, no more. At the cross I bow my knee Where your blood was shed for me There's no greater love than this You have overcome the grave Glory fills the highest place What can separate me now? What can separate us from the love of God? Paul says nothing. Not angels, not demons, not death. Nothing. So you may remember that we are the freest, most joyful community as you partake of this. For this was his body that was broken for you and his blood that was shed to, for you so you and I could come with this kind of joy. You may partake of the emblem.